Greetings. My name is Mara Policelli. I'm the executive director of the University of Notre Dame's Keough School of Global Affairs, Washington, D.C. office. In commemoration of International Women's Day and in recognition of the 20th anniversary of the U.S.-led invasion of Iraq, we're honored to be hosting this conversation, Iraqi Women Speak, Promoting Women, Peace, and Security. This Keough, this Keough School event, um, the Keough School is pleased to have collaborated with several organizations on this event, the Kroc Institute for International Peace Studies and the Pulte Institute for Global Development, which are both part of the Keough School, as well as the Alliance for Peacebuilding, Fourth Freedom Forum, the Cost for War Project, Win Without War, Madre, the International Civil Society Action Center Network, and Our Secure Future. By shedding light on the status of women in Iraq today, our conversation will directly inform the Women, Peace, and Security Agenda of the U.S. government, which evolved from the U.N. Security Council Resolution 1325 and the, U the U.S. Women, Peace, and Security Act of 2017. It recognizes not only, uh, not only the disproportionate impacts of war on women, but also the pivotal role women play in conflict prevention, conflict management, and sustainable peace efforts. Recommendations offered today will be submitted to the U.S. government during the upcoming public comment period for the new Women, Peace, and Security Strategy. In addition, we are honored to have representatives of the U.S. Civil Society Working Group on Women, Peace, and Security with us today to listen to the voices of Iraqi women. This is a nonpartisan network of over 60 civil society organizations with expertise on the impacts of conflict on women and their participation in peace building. This group works directly with officials from the U.S. State Department, Defense Department, Department of Homeland Security, and U.S. Agency for International Development to advise on implementation of the Women, Peace, and Security Act. Now, I'd like to turn the program over to my friend and colleague, David Courtright. He is Professor Emeritus at Notre Dame, where he taught at the Kroc Institute for International Peace Studies for many years. He's the author and co-editor of more than 20 books on nonviolence, peace processes, nonviolent social change, nuclear disarmament, and the use of multilateral sanctions and incentives as tools of international peacemaking. David? Thank you, Mara. Uh, hello, everyone. I hope you can hear me all right. Uh, and happy uh, International Women's Day, which we're celebrating today with this event. Uh, we're also here to mark 20 years since the US-led invasion and occupation of Iraq, which began on March 19 in 2003. Among the justifications of that war was the discourse of women's liberation. But as we'll hear from our speakers, prior to US intervention, women in Iraq were better off than women in many other Arab countries. But because of the war, and because of the sanctions, women lost many gains and bore the brunt of the widespread humanitarian harm that resulted. But Iraq women have continued to fight for their rights and have displayed remarkable resilience in seeking protection from violence and demanding political, economic, and social equality, as we will hear. Let me thank the sponsors of today's program, which is the Kroc Institute of International Peace Studies and the Pulte Institute for Global Development at the Keough School of Global Affairs at Notre Dame, and also the Fourth Freedom Forum. And let me also introduce my colleague and co-author of the reports we are releasing in conjunction with this program, Anna Ramandash. She's an award-winning journalist from Ukraine, a recent Masters of Global Affairs graduate from the Keough School, and now the Howard S. Rembeck Fellow of the Fourth Freedom Forum. Anna will moderate the second half of the program. I also want to thank the co-sponsors of today's event, the Alliance for Peacebuilding, Win Without War, the Cost of War Project, Madre, the International Civil Society Action Network, ICANN, and Our Secure Future. 
Now to our speakers. We're honored to begin the program today with video messages from two members of the US Congress, the co-chairs of the Congressional Women, Peace and Security Caucus, Representative Lois Frankel, Democrat from Florida, and Representative Mike Waltz, Republican from Florida. We're grateful to our colleagues at Our Secure Future for helping to make the connections with our congressional offices. We begin with Representative Frankel. Hello, everyone. I'm Lois Frankel, member of Congress from South Florida. And thank you for inviting me to celebrate International Women's Day and mark the 20th anniversary of the war in Iraq. Thanks. As co-chair of the Women, Peace and Security Caucus with Representative Mike Walsh, I'm honored to speak today about and with you about the inclusion and advancement of women in foreign policy and national security, which is a cause of great importance to many of us in Congress. As we discuss women, peace and security in Iraq and the importance of supporting development and human rights, we must work together to protect and empower Iraqi women from the violence that pervades their life. Unfortunately, gender-based violence is a global problem with nearly one in three women subjected to it worldwide. In Iraq, an estimated 1,000 women are murdered every year in so-called honor killings. And around the world, girls and women face many obstacles, including domestic violence, child marriage, and rape used as a weapon of war. These problems are worsened by the lack of women in policymaking and security roles. That's one of the reasons we founded the Women, Peace, and Security Caucus, in order to further women's engagement in conflict mitigation, political participation, and decision making. All of us to, the, to address these issues, we should support legal protections against gender-based violence, provide greater support for women's social and economic opportunities, tell women's stories in the media, and address the needs of refugee and detainee families. We must also fund public health, nutrition, education, and job creation programs with a women-oriented agenda. There is so much work to do, but I'm confident that together we can make a lot of progress. Because when women and girls succeed, the world succeeds. Again, thank you for the important work you all do, and have a great webinar. Hello everyone, Congressman Mike Waltz here. Thrilled to join you for your fourth Freedom for Forum uh, to mark International Women's Day and also the 20th anniversary of the US liberation of Iraq. Uh, look, uh, a lot to, to talk about here and certainly wish I could be with you, but I, I'm particularly joining you as the co-chair of the Women's Peace and Security Caucus. Uh, the caucus in the United States, along with my Democratic co-chair, uh, Lois Frankel, that provides oversight of the WPS bill. Uh, in fact, the first bill in the United States is the first country uh, back in 2017 uh, that passed legislation implementing uh, the WPS uh, uh, recommendations from uh, the United Nations. Uh, I'll tell you, I join uh, this caucus and join your forum from the perspective of a veteran uh, as a Green Beret uh, that has conducted operations all over the world, in particular West Africa, the Middle East, multiple tours uh, in Afghanistan. And I could tell you for certain, based on my experiences, uh, where women thrive in politics, in business, in civil society, in their governments, uh, extremism does not. Uh, and in my experience, there has been a direct correlation to that relationship. Uh, in so many of these fragile societies and so many of these fragile states uh, where women uh, are often uh, the force in uh, their tribe, in their household, in their villages, and when they're given opportunities 
as they rightfully should be, to thrive then in those societies, those societies, those tribes, those villages, those governments are better for them. As we note the anniversary of Iraq, women have certainly made strides there in many ways, but absolutely have a long way to go. Some statistics show over 1,000 women a year still die from honor killings, from their relatives, from their families. They have made strides in parliament, but we have a long way to go, and we absolutely have to support legislation that gives them additional legal freedoms, that give them economic freedoms and opportunities, and give them, frankly, protections. We will continue. I am also co-chair of the Kurdish Caucus. We will continue to press these issues with those, with the Iraqi government, and frankly, with all governments across the Middle East. I just have to take a moment to also talk about the grotesque, disgusting, and just heartbreaking status of Afghan women. And to see this kind of notion out there that there's a Taliban 2.0 or there's a new moderate version when they absolutely have lied and they've absolutely broken every promise that they made, and now women can't even leave their homes, much less attend school or university. They can't even get past a sixth grade education at this point. So while we're making some slow, too slow strides in some areas, we've gone absolutely the other direction in so many others. And then just a final point. We have to highlight and talk about and put a spotlight on the plight of Uyghur women in Western China, where videos and other documents that have been leaked out of the Chinese Communist Party show that Uyghur women are forced into labor camps, are forced into concentration camps. If they are pregnant, they are forced to have an abortion if they are not. They have a forced sterilization campaign. I know these are difficult things to talk about, but we need to understand that according to some think tank studies, over 80 international brands, clothes and items that we use every day, that we buy in our everyday lives and in stores across the United States and Western world are made with forced labor from women in China. So there's other issues we could certainly talk about. I wish I was there with you, but just know that this is not a partisan issue. This isn't about Democrats or Republicans. These are about basic human rights and freedoms. The United States has to continue to lead in that regard. I certainly hope to do that from my seat in Congress. And we also have to demand accountability around the world. All right, everyone have a great forum, a great conference. Thank you so much for everything that you do and hope to see you all soon. Dr. David, I'm not able to hear you. Thank you. Uh, now, let me introduce our uh, four distinguished speakers to start the program. Uh, I'll introduce all, introduce all four, and then they will speak in order. Uh, we begin with Yanar Mohammed, who is an activist and feminist leader uh, from Baghdad, although today she's joining us from Toronto. Uh, she's been active in providing shelters for women who have been victimized by sex trafficking and so-called honor killings, uh, is the leader of the Organization of Women's Freedom in Iraq, uh, and has started and runs her own newspaper and radio program named Al Musawat, or Equality. After that, we'll have Professor Nadia Al Ali, is director of the Center for Middle East Studies at Brown University, where she is also the Robert Family Professor of International Studies, Professor of Anthropology and Middle East Studies. Her main research interests are in feminist activism and gendered mobilization. Her publications include What Kind of Liberation, Women in the Occupation of Iraq, and Iraqi Women, 
untold stories from 1948 to the present. A third will be Noor Ghazi. She's an international peace activist from Baghdad originally. Noor is currently teaching at the University of North Carolina Greensboro at University of North Carolina Chapel Hill and in Durham, focusing on Arabic, peace studies and conflict resolution. She's also, also the producer of the 2022 documentary, Mosul, the mother of two springs. And fourth will be Yasmin Chumarin. She's a researcher and practitioner focused on women, peace and security, uh, joining us today from Baghdad, and also focuses on broader gender and security issues in post-conflict settings, particularly in Iraq. Yanar, please. Um, unmuted, yeah? Okay. Um, March of 2003 was a time that changed the lives of tens of millions of Iraqi people, myself included. Uh, seeing our cities being bombed and uh, our lives changed altogether. That's all right. Uh, I can hear you fine. I can hear you fine. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, uh, just a second, Professor. Can you please mute yourself? Sorry about that. Go ahead, Yanar. Okay. So uh, before, before that time, Iraqi women were known to be the most educated in our region and those who had access to work, to education, and who, were, who had some independence. But since 2003 and until now, our reputation became for the fact that there are daily killings for women, that there's a thriving sex trafficking uh, situation in Iraq. And uh, because uh, we are unable to achieve any of our freedoms that we are uh, demanding as women, um, the sectarian divide that was imposed into the country after the invasion of 2003 had caused a tragedy in some parts of the country and we've you've all heard of the uh, thousands of Yazidi women who were uh, bought and sold and not only Yazidi women but also women who were thought of as the different or of the other religion and the other sect were also bought and sold and um, and even inside Iraq uh, while uh, the, in the parts of the country where it is thought of as there is relative peace, uh, women uh, suffer daily from uh, violence, from abuse, from trafficking. And uh, we as feminists, we started out in 2003, we thought it was an opportunity to ask for equality for women. But then we found out that the women's right to life is not guaranteed. And uh, we had to open a shelter for women that expanded because the demand was so high. And um, I mean, even the using the word demand is not really very adequate for, for this uh, matter because uh, Iraqi women began to lose their lives in numbers that are unprecedented. Uh, we heard the congressperson saying 1,000 women lose their lives to honor killing every year. It's, I think, two or three times as much because the number of bodies that are being thrown to designated spots as the, the hill of the sinners or the, uh, the, the dam behind Sadr City, these places are full of women's bodies. And uh, we as women's organizations opened, not all of us, some of us opened shelters for women because the government is not doing much to save women. And we find that the fact that we are sheltering women makes us a public enemy. Every other year, there's either a lawsuit against us or an, uh, they want to arrest us, accusing us of uh, encouraging uh, women that uh, to escape their homes and other kinds of accusations. Uh, in general, uh, women's lives during, I'm sorry for the noise here. Uh, 
in general, women's lives within 20 years uh, have witnessed us losing all the status that we used to have, at least in part of the country. Uh, we also lost uh, our access, full access to education, uh, access to free hospitalization. Our reproductive rights are taken away from us. And of course, uh, we have to look different now because the ruling authorities are the most conservative parts of the society. Just imagine your country being invaded by somebody from halfway across the world and imposing the most, uh, the most uh, reactionary to rule upon you. Just imposing uh, those who do not allow women to education, to marriage, or to, the, to their just basic standards of life are ruling. And our, our uh, campaign in the last two years were about repealing the article in the criminal code that was brought by Saddam Hussein, the previous dictator. He put an article into the criminal code to allow the killings of women for honor reasons. And we have been campaigning for two years just to repeal those articles. Article 409 of the criminal code and uh, to, uh, to, to revise Article 128. And the government not only does not respond to us, when they respond, they look down at us and they tell us that our uh, demands are dismissed. And then they, uh, they uh, take the opportunity to put in a lawsuit against us, accusing us that we want to destroy the society. And now there is an arrest warrant against myself and against three of my colleagues, just because we shelter women, just because we save women from honor killing, from tra trafficking, and also uh, for changing their papers. When, when we shelter women, they accuse us of encouraging women to prostitution. When we defend LGBT from being killed, they call us trying to destroy the society. And this is the Iraq that we have witnessed in 20 years time. Uh, we are no longer talking about the right to self-determination, the fact that we were uh, uh, attacked from halfway across the globe. We just want our uh, women's right to life and a bit of equality to the males and that we are unable to get. Um, the ruling uh, social structures are the ones that predate the, the modern uh, governance or modern states in the region. And the women are the biggest losers in it all. Um, I should not be taking too much of the others' times, but I, I would be like, uh, I would like to hear if there are any questions about it later on. Thank you for inviting me to speak here. And uh, 20 years on the, on the event that changed our lives and brought in tragedy into our lives is something that needs to be remembered. Thank you for remembering and for inviting me to speak here. Thank you. And I just wanted to remind everybody who's on the panel that we will have time for questions, but after all of the speakers. And now I pass the word to Nadia. Yeah, thank you. And thank you, um, Yanar. And now you've been doing amazing work over the past 20 years. Um, just uh, having listened to the Congress people, I mean, I do, I think, I do appreciate um, what a uh, congressman said about the correlation between an encroachment on women's rights and a general sense of extremism and authoritarianism. But I would say that we don't have to look to Iraq. I think that has also been evident in the US actually. And I, I, I think that the US over the years has lost its status actually as being uh, the sort of natural proponents of women's rights. But I don't want to diverge, I want to speak about Iraq and I want to remember International Women's Day of 2004. This was uh, nearly a year after the invasion of Iraq when then President George Bush addressed around 250 women from around the world who had gathered at the White House a day. And George Bush said, the advance of women's rights and the advance of liberty 
are ultimately inseparable, inseparable. And he was supported by his wife, Laura, who herself hailed the administration's success in achieving greater rights for Afghan women. And the president claimed on that day that the advance of freedom in the greater Middle East has given new rights and new hopes to women. Now, we just heard from Yanar what the situation is. So the truth and the reality unfolding could not have been any further from the rhetoric of liberation and women's rights that we had heard from the US administration. In fact, I agree with Yana that women did become the biggest losers in the post-invasion disaster. Now, of course, men also bore the brunt in terms of direct armed violence, but women, and we've seen it in many contexts and over the years, women have been particularly hard hit by poverty, by malnutrition, displacement, lack of health services and a crumbling infrastructure, um, including also power cuts and so on. And very importantly, the shift towards greater social conservatism that has severely curtailed women's lives, starting with women's dress codes, women access to education, women's mobility, women's ability to, um, to socialize, to meet people. And of course, most tragically, the increase, the increase of different forms of gender-based violence. Now, don't get me wrong. I mean, women in Iraq did suffer from discrimination and violence well before 2003. I mean, there was deep-rooted patriarchy, especially in, in rural and tribal areas. And of course, the pervasive political repression of the regime of Saddam Hussein. Yet, when we look at the 35 years of Ba'ath regime, we find that there was some form of state, uh, state feminism, that there was at least uh, an infrastructure that allowed women access to education, there was um, healthcare available. We also really need to uh, remind ourselves that prior to the invasion, 13 years of the most comprehensive sanction system had a devastating impact on women and gender relations in Iraq. So when I think about um, you know, war and conflict and the inv invasion, I feel like we can't understand the post-invasion context if we don't also pay attention to the um, 13 years prior um, where society already shifted towards greater social conservatism. And many of the developments that got accentuated post-2003 um, started already uh, during the sanction, sanctions uh, system. Um, now, I would like to say though that um, while it is so important after 20 years to point out that the invasion and the occupation not only led to uh, increased authoritarianism, widespread lawlessness and chaos and violence, um, and a hyper, hyper militarized state. But we cannot, I would say at this point, I think it would be wrong to only point our fingers at the US-led invasion. I think we also have to recognize that um, Iraqi politicians, corrupt politicians, sectarian pol politicians, uh, tribal leaders, militia leaders, religious figures um, have not just been puppets of the US and the UK, but they have also been instrumental in creating the situation that Yana was describing in detail to us. Um, and Finally, and I, I, you know, don't think that we always, you know, have to end on a positive note. But I think it's also important <clears throat> to stress that Iraqi women are not just simply passive victims. I mean, Yana and her organization is one example, but there are many, many uh, women who have been mobilizing, um, you know, have been trying to resist. And I have to say, when we look at the recent protests across cities in Iraq. Young women were part of these protests. And if there is any hope for Iraq, it's with the youth who is not remembering anymore the regime of Saddam Hussein. They might, but they do remember, they know living in a country that 
well, has experienced invasion, occupation, and also great, great corruption and sectarianism. And they want a different life. And they, I feel that there's hope looking to the youth, including young women. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nadia Noor. Okay. Thank you very much for inviting me here with a great group of people and great women to speak uh, on their side today. So I would reiterate what uh, Dr. Nadia and Ms. Yanar um, talked about women and women rights and the condition of women in Iraq. But I would like to share that from personal experiences and from firsthand experiences that I lived uh, in Iraq. So we have talked about how educated women were in Iraq despite the US sanctions during the 90s. Growing up during that time, um, I still remember that we did not even have a pencil to do our homework or we had to be creative on what type of book bag we could um, make to take to school um, out of like rice bags or old jeans that my aunt would help us create a book, a book bag. But I wanna take a step back and also remember those great women in my life who I've witnessed um, living under this harsh conditions in Iraq. For example, my, my mom's aunt who spent her entire life until she passed away two years ago, mourning and trying to figure out the fate of her son who was sent to the war with Iraq and Iran in, uh, in the 90s, or the fate of her uh, brother who was sent uh, in, the, in, the, in the Gulf War. Those women set an example for us. And um, moving forward to 2003, I remember that era clearly because I witnessed it as well. And as Ms. CNR mentioned, this time had changed our lives and forever. Um, as, as a young Iraqis in my 14s, I was thinking that now we're going to have the freedom, now we're going to have the freedom of speech, and now not all the walls are going to have ears, as we used to say under Saddam Hussein. But this is not what we have witnessed in Iraq. Uh, the door to a chaos, to a sectarian violence started in Iraq. I personally have seen my, my best friend was shot and killed right in front of me after we left to school because the convoy was, the US-led coalition convoy was targeted and then they start shooting randomly, killing students, killing people around them. So having to live those feelings over and over and my best friend was just counted as a collateral damage of the invasion. She just was buried as a number, as a statistics, which becomes very hard to process because when do we need to humanize this conflict, we need to talk about the human cost of war rather than looking at it from a, a very narrow angle of political and, and um, what were the mistakes that were done. Um, it is hard to look at those people who were buried as numbers those people who have dreams, who have families, who have children, uh, who are full of lives. So, and then in, in 2006, and um, with the sectarian violence between the Shia and Sunni in Iraq, um, I, I, for the first time in my life, I, I realized after I asked my parents what were our backgrounds, and my dad told me he was Sunni and my mom was Shia. So in, I haven't heard these terms in my life uh, unless a friend of mine at school asked me saying, Noor, what is your tribe? What is your background? Are you Shia or Sunni? When I asked my parents, their answer was, there are no differences. We should not be talking about that. And, and, and as, a, as a girl grew up in my family, I've never seen any differences in practice between my parents. Um, but in 2006, when my, my dad's uh, first cousin was kidnapped and he was uh, tortured and killed with the drills and thrown naked on Baghdad trash, um, they contacted my dad and asked him to go pick him up. And when my dad came back, he said he could not pick him up on that day because it was set at that time when a person is killed and goes to be picked up by his family. The family would also be murdered at the hospital's door. Um, my dad came back and he said, we had to leave Iraq because um, human had no values in Iraq. How could a person be killed in this 
monstrous way, in this, in this terrible way. And the decision came that we needed to leave Iraq, and which was on November 6th of um, 2006, and it was my sweet 16th birthday. And on our way to Syria, we were stopped by gunmen simply asking a question of, what is your last name? It's a, it's a very simple question. I could ask anybody, what is your last name? And they, they give me their last name. But in Iraq, that last name it meant, and it told you a lot about the person. So we have my mom, Shia, in the car, and my dad stated his last name, and he told them he was Sunni. And um, they did not shoot, because on that day, they were looking for Shia to kill. But the next car to us that was full of children, women, and men, they were instantly murdered. Um, on the scene just because they were Shia on, on the wrong spot on the wrong time. Um, and then lived in Syria for two years. I've, um, I've gotten my, um, my um, high school degree from Syria, but I also wonder about all this um, mental health that, uh, or the mental um, struggle that women go through uh, during the time of conflict and war, this also goes unseen. The struggle I was going through in Syria was great that I eventually decided I didn't want to go to school anymore because I did not feel I was fit. I did not feel like I could, I could communicate with other, with other um, students. And then we were granted a refugee status to the United States in 2008. Um, and we were resettled here in the US and I was able to get the quality education that I've always dreamed about. And this is just, these are just like highlights of my stories and, and many other women in Iraq, they live much more um, traumatic events. They go through much more um, violence and, 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 um, and conflict as well. And to conclude, I would like to say that, um, violence and war destroy our ability to feel human. But I would like to thank you all for giving us the platform to really humanize this conflict and try to understand how can we help moving forward. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Noor. Um, and I would like to pass the word to Yasmin. Thank you so much. Um, first of all, just thank you to the organizers for inviting us. And thank you to my fellow panelists as well, whose work I've admired for a very long time. So it's such a pleasure to be uh, to be with you this evening, this afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, I wanted to focus uh, my comments coming from the perspective of where I sit, which is um, having worked in academic research and now working as a practitioner, I, I work on coordination across different UN agencies. Um, and so I've been able to kind of see from the perspective of um, someone that really wanted to spend a lot of time and research, understanding the experience of Iraqi women, um, but also being able to reflect on uh, the incredible amount of work that, that women have done both before 2003, but certainly afterwards. Um, so I, I really heartily agree when I hear Nadia talk about women not just being passive victims, but as we can see from, from the wonderful panelists today, there is such a wealth of work, of effort, of activism, organizing and programming um, that has happened certainly before 2003, but really blossomed afterwards, despite the challenges and the, the kind of awful experiences that, that we know so well. Um, so I wanted to cover a little bit um, some of uh, the key areas that, that we can see a lot of organizing happening um, and maybe looking forward to uh, what we're seeing happen in the future, hopefully. Um, and then closing with really a few key messages to the international community, to donors, to embassies, to international organizations that work in this country and, and work with the aim of supporting women uh, across the country, of course, some things that maybe we can keep in mind as we think about uh, that kind of support and what it could look like. Um, so of course, when, you know, when we think about uh, Iraq and what happened after the 2003 invasion, I think the majority of narratives of stories that we were hearing were not coming from the perspective of women. Um, but what's frustrating with that is I think we, it was so clear immediately after 2003 how much organizing was going on. Um, so immediately after that uh, invasion, you can see a lot of um, a lot of focus both on keeping day to day to life going, but also on taking up opportunities that came with um, 
new political order, new political system and so on. Um, so certainly there was a lot of organizing at that early period around political participation and on getting a quota for women to be in parliament um, that was successful. And now we have a 25% quota in the country. Um, but of course, you know, hand in hand with that is also uh, a landscape that meant a lot of insecurity um, of women, uh, of, of the population in general, but certainly a lot of gendered violence that targeted women very, very specifically that really uh, developed and grew after 2003. And so you can see women organize in formal organizations in informal ways as well to respond to that changing landscape, to come together, to to deliver services as, as we see in ours organization do, um, but also to advocate. And what that developed into is of course, a lot of advocacy around, um, hopefully though still in progress, um, a, a, viol a bill that would uh, target domestic violence or anti-domestic violence bill that unfortunately is still, is still not a law in this country. And what that's a reminder of is of course, that period meant um, that organizing uh, change the landscape of what civil society looks like, what organizations look like. Um, and so what we see today is, yes, a vast array of organizations at the national level, at the local level and different governorates. And then, as, of course, you know, young women coming together through the Tashreen protests to really um, show us that there's a new generation of activists and of voices that really want to be heard, that want to have a voice, want to have a say in what a new Iraq looks like, what that might look like for young women and young men as well. Um, and that, you know, looks across the board, both the issues around political participation and violence, but also much broader than that around what cities should look like, what civic spaces should look like, issues around environmentalism and a host of other um, things as well. So what I'm always so humbled by when I uh, talk to, to people to kind of in different parts of the country is just how much energy there is in young people, despite the challenges the, the difficulties, the security landscape, and really the, the weight of um, the, the sorts of issues that we see in the state um, as well. So what that leads me to is maybe some key messages um, that I hope we, we can share that I hope my panelists also agree with. Um, when it comes to uh, the international community and in, a, in all its formats, uh, as they seek to work on Iraq and to support Iraqi women um, through the Women, Peace and Security Act, action that we see for the US and other countries, but also through direct engagement with activists, with civil society and so on. Um, now, of course, we're working in a landscape where funding is changing very dr drastically. Iraq is no longer considered a humanitarian case, but it's rather a development case, which means funding is lessening in the country. But what that means is there's a reprioritization that needs to happen to make sure that um, when support is, uh, is put through to Iraq, it's put through to organizations that see, um, you know, that seek to support local voices, national voices, the kind of activism that we've seen and heard about uh, today, of course, as well. Um, and it's important, of course, that women's organizations and women's voices are prioritized in these spaces through, you know, um, earmarking funds and so on to make sure that women's organizations continue to get support even when that funding is less. Um, there's one thing that I think uh, I've, my work and, and research has also highlighted, which is that there is a wealth of organizations in Iraq, some very large and some a lot smaller. And what we've seen in the past is that um, international organizations and funders tend to work with the same organizations over and over again. And what's really important is there's a recognition of the diversity of you know, smaller organizations, young people coming together, maybe in more informal ways and seeking ways to support those voices as well. So the international community acting more as a facilitator or supporting and, and advocacy as well as resourcing um, the ability of these newer, uh, new generations of, of activists and, and, um, and uh, advocators essentially to access decision-making in, in the variety of ways that they can. Um, and then of course, uh, always keeping in mind that whatever agenda is happening is not so much crafted at the international level around what women's participation should look like or what the rights conversation should look like, but really listening, listening to women's organizations, to, to young women, to activists about what they're demanding and then um, amplifying those voices as much as possible in the different avenues that we get access to. 
um, thank you again for the opportunity to speak today. Thank you to my fellow panelists and looking forward to the discussion. Sir, thank you very much, Yasmin, and thank you to all of the four panelists. Um, I feel very humbled to be listening to all of you. Uh, I am going to, to present the report that David and I produced based on the interviews with our renowned panelists and also with other women experts from Iraq and beyond. I will be very brief for many reasons. The first reason is that I have to. The second reason is that I want to give um, our participants as much time as possible to ask questions. And because we also have two more great speakers after this. So very, very briefly, and if we can have my PowerPoint, perfect. I'm the only one with a PowerPoint and there are only two slides, so don't worry. Uh, primarily, David and I and uh, Marcel, who's not here, but um, whose presence we're all feeling, I'm sure we've prepared a report called Women and the Iraq War 20 years later. And here we study, we analyze what has happened in Iraq in relationship to development and very often regression of women's rights in the past 20 years and even beyond. And we also prepared a policy brief called Promoting Protection and Empowerment for Iraqi Women, where we provide actionable um, steps and recommendations that can be done with the cooperation of the US government, international donors, and Iraqi women's groups on the ground. Uh, can we have the next slide? And by the way, all of the panelists, all of the participants, everybody who registered for this webinar, you will get links to both of these documents. So you will have access to them. So um, I grouped our recommendations in four very important areas. And the first area or the first aspect is the legal aspect. We've heard Yanar speak about the case of women's shelters in Iraq. And this is a very big deal. So um, this is related to the legal aspect of operating in the country. So what the US government can do, what the international organizations can do and should do is to urge the Iraqi government to support shelters and other uh, legal protections against gender-based violence. So instead of what's happening right now where the government is interfering and preventing a lot of women's rights organizations and women's groups from doing their work, the government should not do it, obviously, and actually should support the organizations that are already doing something. And the international governments, international donors have a leverage in doing that, in supporting, in supporting change, in facilitating change. We will talk a little bit more about this, how this can be done without causing backlash. Another important legal aspect is working with victims and legal pra practitioners to change laws and practices that legalize violence against women, such as encourage changes in the personal statutes law. For example, um, currently there's a possibility to have some temporary marriages, uh, which legalize rape. For example, if a rapist marries their victim, uh, then the rapist is not uh, going to be punished. So these laws obviously have to be changed. Honor killings should be forbidden because they still happen um, in different, you know, in different amounts, but in, in different places across the country. Another important aspect of our recommendations is social economic support. So there is a need to provide better investment, more grants, more programs that would support education and health problem, programs targeting women. For example, access to credit, financial incentives, small businesses, and so on. Media representation, telling women's stories in the media so women are actually seen, heard. They are telling their stories themselves. This webinar is one of such examples and this can be multiplied and this can be done on a greater level with you know, representatives of different governments, different institutions and so on. But women should be speaking for themselves. Women should be telling their stories and other women who would like to take action should be able to hear them. And finally, uh, refugees and IDPs is, is another uh, group that uh, needs to be included uh, whenever we're talking about empowering, protecting, integrating uh, women in Iraq. 
So there is a huge need to provide more assistance for Iraq and neighboring countries while addressing the needs of Iraqi refugees and detainee families. And that also includes ISIS widows and their children. Their integration is crucial. And this is something that has to be done with international financing, support, cooperation between different actors. What we're seeing right now is that a lot of Iraqi women's organizations in the country are working rather in spite of all of the difficult conditions in the country. So there's not a supportive environment that would facilitate their work. And this needs to be changed. And different groups have to be contributing to that. A very important message for the US government, for the US decision makers, for the US academia is to stay engaged. So basically we should not be talking about the rights of Iraqi women or women in general on 8th of March only. We should be talking about that throughout the year, throughout the years, and keep that topic, um, keep the to topic important, keep the topic going so it reaches as many people as possible, as many decision makers as possible. Thank you very much. This is all for my super tiny presentation. And now I'm very happy to present our final two speakers, the last but not least, or how Americans say it. Uh, so we are going to have Megan Corrado. She is the Director of Policy and Advocacy at Alliance for Peace Building. And we're also going to have Elena Ortiz. She is Research Manager at Women, Peace and Security Index at Georgetown Institute for Women, Peace and Security. So I am passing the word to Megan. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, everyone, so much for being here today. Happy International Women's Day. Um, and Anna, as, as you pointed out, it's so critical for us to pause and reflect um, on where we are, where how far we've come, but what are the challenges and what actions do we need to take to move forward to really advance gender equality worldwide. So thank you for hosting this event today. Thanks to the co-sponsoring organizations and all these incredible inspiring women with which I'm very honored to be sharing this screen. So in addition to my role at AFP, um, I also serve as a member of the executive committee of the US Civil Society Working Group on Women, Peace and Security, uh, which more kindly mentioned in the outset of this discussion. We're up to almost 70 organizations now and our secretariat is the United States Institute of Peace. And our members include some other incredible women who some of which are on the line, I'm pleased to see, who have helped draft and garner support for UN Security Council Resolution 1325, the subsequent resolutions um, advancing WPS agenda, as well as the US Women, Peace and Security Act strategy and implementation plans. And for well over two decades, we've been fighting for the advancement of the WPS agenda in the United States, in Iraq, Afghanistan, and every corner of the world. Because we know that when women are involved in peace processes, peace agreements are more successful and durable. But we also know that where women face high levels of gender-based violence, the countries in which they live are more likely to experience conflict and fragility. 23 years since 1325, these aren't unfounded claims. We have the data to back it up. We have evidence. My colleague Elena from Georgetown will take a deep dive into this and they've been doing incredible work um, gathering this data for, for some time now. So it's, it's not theoretical anymore. We know this. And based on this evidence, it is clear that investing in women's participation in decision-making, empowerment and protection serves both donors' national interests as well as promotes international security. Support for WPS all around the world isn't just a moral imperative, it is security and an economic one. It just makes good sense. We are really excited that the US government is currently in the process of updating its US, the US national strategy on WPS. Um, they recently convened some consultations with US-based civil society. And while that's a really good start, we urge them to continue to hold extensive conversations with diverse NGOs and stakeholders, both here in the US as well as abroad. Our foreign facing strategies must acknowledge the needs, challenges, and opportunities that exist globally so that we can most effectively deploy our foreign assistance and programming. And we know that a draft of the updated strategy will be released for public comment as more actually referenced as well. We urge the administration to provide at least a three week window for individuals and organizations, both here again in the US and around the world to provide comments to allow for a wide cross section of perspectives to be incorporated in the editing process. And while a strategy that reflects the lessons learned in the last several years is a positive step forward, we need a commitment at every level of decision-making within the key agencies in the United States tasked with operationalizing it, as well as robust funding for implementation. 
Unfortunately, the dark reality is that international assistance is stretched significantly right now. The war in Ukraine, residual effects from COVID, and the compounding challenges of increasing conflict, climate change, food insecurity, inflation, mass displacement, and the tremendous humanitarian crises globally are putting immense stress on available resources. But because of this, it's more important than ever that donors are more strategic in the deployment of their dollars. And there's no smarter investment than in women in Iraq and globally. In Iraq, it is critical that donors prevent succumbing to fatigue and use assistance as a means for progress, particularly for women, girls, members of the LGBT plus community and other marginalized populations. As has been referenced here, this is an opportunity for leverage. Donors can use their foreign assistance leverage to secure guarantees that NGOs can expand and continue to safely operate shelter to support survivors of GBV in all its forms. Donors can also use leverage to encourage and provide technical capacity to assist in the passage of a comprehensive GBV law, as well as other laws that fix loopholes in the personal status legal regime in Iraq. These types of laws and protections are essential for women, including those from the LGBTQ plus community and minority groups that are active in public life, as we've seen real time with some of our speakers here. They are increasingly targets of violence and retribution. Now, these are just a few key areas in which donor, donors should utilize their power of the purse to exert influence to promote gender equality, meaningful participation in public life, and fundamental human rights and safety. And as Yasmin raised this, but I would be remiss if I did not foot stomp the need to support international and local women civil society organizations. This is a consistent problem everywhere on earth. Within Iraq, the CSOs lack resources to address the ongoing problems, including those which existed before the war, as well as the conflict and post-conflict specific impacts. Donors should funnel direct, flexible, and multi-year funds to local civil society organizations throughout the country, and not just the usual suspects, the English-speaking ones, and those considered elite. Local CSOs best understand the local context and challenges, and thus can drive local solutions. Local actors must be involved in all aspects of program design, implementation, and monitoring and evaluation. In the United States, the Biden administration has staked a commitment to the localization agenda. Last year, USAID released a local capacity strengthening policy, and repeatedly we have heard Administrator Power um, speak about the commitment to significant funding to local actors over the next couple of years. However, the promise of those words have not been realized. It's time for them to walk the walk and lift up, lift up local women's civil society stakeholders in Iraq and elsewhere. The U.S. and other donors must also support the implementation of Iraq's National Action Plan on WPS and women's involvement in all peace, political, security, and electoral decision-making process. And international civil society must act as well. Why many international NGOs have done fantastic work, training, technical capacity building, and other efforts, collectively, we haven't done enough for long enough. Again, this is a sustained issues and challenges that our Iraqi sisters face, and we must stand with them. And just because the kinetic involvement of U.S. and coalition forces has formally ended, it doesn't mean donor and implementer support to address the needs of women should as well. International CSOs must continue to advocate for funding to support Iraqi women, the LGBTQ community, and other minorities. We must amplify the voices of Iraqi women, as the policy brief so pointedly points out. In the United States, we need to bring our Iraqi sisters to the Hill, go up to Congress, meet with the administration. And while we might have a new Congress here, it is still filled with hundreds of individuals who voted for the U.S. invasion. They need to hear about the long-term impacts from the women that are living them. We also must continue to urge the U.S. government to utilize additional prevention-oriented laws and strategies, such as the Global Fragility Act and the Eli Wiesel Genocide and Atrocities Prevention Act, to learn lessons about WPS and gender-sensitive programming and support that can be applied in Iraq and other global contexts. And lastly, the international community writ large. While it is important for us to pause and reflect as we approach the 20th anniversary of the US-led coalition's intervention in Iraq, we cannot forget about the ongoing challenges and needs that continue. Iraq has suffered through decades of turmoil, authoritarian rule, conflict, extremism, and instability, creating immense structural barriers, inequality, and fragility. Concurrently, food insecurity, inflation, rising energy prices, climate shocks, mass displacement, democracy backsliding, and geopolitical competition around the world will require significant investment, creative policies, and innovative programs that center and empower women in the short and long term in Iraq and beyond. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Megan. And I pass the word to Elena. 
Great, thank you so much, um, Anna, and, and thank you for all the panelists today for sharing um, these important insights, um, especially to the Iraqi women here today for sharing their personal and, and lived experiences. Um, so I'm Elena, um, I manage the Women, Peace and Security Index at Georgetown's, uh, Georgetown University's Institute for Women, Peace and Security. Um, and I'm here to provide a brief overview of the WPS Index, profile Iraq's performance on the index, um, and briefly discuss how the index can be used as a policy tool. So the WPS index multidimensionally measures, scores, and ranks 170 countries around the world um, in terms of the status of women. It takes into account countries' performance on 11 indicators of women's well-being structured around the three dimensions of women's inclusion, justice, and security. The inclusion dimension looks at economic, social, and political aspects, considering indicators such as women's mean years of schooling, bank account access and representation in national parliaments. The justice dimension looks at both formal and informal sources of discrimination in the law and through harmful norms and attitudes. And the security dimension looks at women's security in the home, in the community, and at the societal level, looking at rates of intimate partner violence, perceptions of safety, and levels of battle deaths. All data on the index are drawn from publicly available data sets from large organizations such as the World Bank, UN agencies, and the Gallup World Poll. Um, and we combine performance on these 11 indicators to generate an index score between zero and one, ultimately determining country rankings. The index is leveraged in multiple ways and by multiple stakeholders. Researchers and academics use the index to track patterns and trends over time and within regions. Activists use the index to hold governments accountable to their promises. Uh, and perhaps most relevant to the discussion today, policymakers use the index to identify tangible entry points around where more investment in women is needed. So before talking more about how the index can specifically aid policymaking in Iraq, um, let's look at how Iraq performs on the index. So of the 170 countries that we rank, Iraq ranks 166, uh, the fifth worst country in the world in terms of women's status and opportunities. So of the 11 indicators, uh, Iraq performs among the bottom 20 countries in the world for seven indicators and among the bottom 10 for three indicators. So these three indicators are past year rates of intimate partner violence, employment, and discriminatory norms. 45% of Iraqi women have experienced physical or sexual violence at the hand of an intimate partner in the past year, and this is the highest estimated rate in the world. Iraq also has the world's second lowest rate of female employment at just 10%, um, and has the world's third highest level of discriminatory norms, where an estimated 53% of men in the country believe it's unacceptable for women to work outside of the home. Other particular areas of concern include financial inclusion and perceptions of safety. Less than one in five women has access to her own bank account in the country, and over 40% of women report feeling not safe in the neighborhood where they live. Um, regionally, Iraq performs among the bottom five countries in the Middle East and North Africa for seven of the 11 indicators, many of which are those just mentioned. One area where Iraq performs well is female cell phone ownership, which is at nearly 100% in, in the country, um, and Iraq also performs above the global average for women's parliamentary representation um, at a rate of 27% compared to a global average of about 25%. So as has been discussed in depth today, um, fragility and instability in Iraq and in countries around the world disproportionately affect women. So the WPS index offers targeted insights into where more uh, investments are needed. Priority areas include um, targeted efforts to transform harmful gender norms, which is needed universally in countries around the world, and signifies an important step to reducing risks of intimate partner violence and expanding women's inclusion and economic opportunities. There's also a need for increased women's leadership and representation in government to ensure and advocate for more equitable legislation and access to rights. There's also a strong need for expanded access to girls' education. Currently, girls in Iraq attend school for an average of just six years, limiting their access to economic opportunities and future agency. And lastly, earlier in the discussion today, um, I think it was Noor who importantly highlighted the dangers of reducing the situation in Iraq and, and conflict-affected countries um, to statistics um, and the need to humanize the impacts of instability. Um, so to this critical point um, in recognizing that the WPS index is a tool that 
very much relies on aggregate statistics. I want to emphasize that the index can certainly be leveraged as a policy tool to help identify urgent policy priorities, but ultimately amplifying the voices and lived experiences of Iraqi women is the most powerful engine for policy and change. And it is never the intention of, of the WPS index to actively substitute or, or overshadow that. Um, so thank you so much. I will wrap up there and I very much look forward to the rest of the discussion today. Thank you so much um, for your very interesting input. Uh, we did include WPS findings in our report, so they're all you know, directly linked. Now I'm going to open up to questions to our uh, participants. So if you are uh, if you want to ask something, one of our speakers, all, all of the speakers, feel free to ask your questions in the chat. And I will choose and I will ask the questions to our speakers later on. But because I am a moderator, which gives me um, complete uncontrollable, uncontrollable power um, as, uh, you know, somebody who's speaking right now, I'm going to start with the question that interests me um, the most. And I think that's Unfortunately, sadly, a very timely question. How safe is it to do the women's work or work on women's rights in Iraq right now? How safe it is to be an activist working on women's rights? Um, I would probably ask Yanar to um, start up with opening that question, but other speakers are also welcome. To, to join and answer that. Thank you, Anna. Thank you for the question. Um, the problem with the insecurity that a uh, women's defender or a feminist goes through doesn't come only from the, uh, the, uh, the intimidation of uh, security agencies or police or the courts, but it also comes from the militias where we have uh, more than 65 militias in the country. All of them are fully armed and there's also a, an army of militias who is running the country. So the source of uh, fear and intimidation has have become so many that you, you start addressing it to the government, that, but there are so many others also that can uh, be a source of uh, um, insecurity for you. Um, I, I would say that we, we do rely on the, uh, on the international community to help us out sometimes when the militias that are inside the government are taking us to court I'll give you an example here. I was I I was uh, shown an arrest warrant in my name that says she needs to be arrested immediately because she's a human trafficker. I mean, we've been speaking about human trafficking for 20 years and we've been educating the community about it and we're uh, we're sheltering women, protecting them from human trafficking only to find out that the accusation of human trafficking is on us. So it's a very twisted reality, how to gain your foothold and who to address your insecurities and your threats is, is very scary. We did speak to some of the embassies and especially to the American embassy. They, and although they ask us to shelter many Iraqi American women, but they said they may help us. But it's not, so if you are a feminist, you're in a country of a post-conflict zone, you are on your own. You may try to uh, find those who believe in your right to life and your right to do your activism and your right to protection, but uh, you're basically on your own. Could I come in here and just uh, follow up? Um, I mean, I think this is a good point to, or is uh, sadly a point to remember that shortly after the invasion, when Iraqi women's rights were actually turning towards um, the US led military invasion and asked for support. I mean, several um, women's rights activists at the time told me that uh, the military personnel told them, we don't do women. 
So, you know, very early on, despite this rhetoric of women's liberation, it was very clear that it was going to be the first thing that dropped off the agenda. And I think one of the tragedies of the situation in Iraq 20 years afterwards is that, of course, any kind of insecurity and threat towards women's rights advocates has to be seen within both the wider context of an increased authoritarianism. I mean, we have kind of come full circle again in that political dissent is not possible in Iraq anymore. I mean, if you open your mouth, uh, you know, whether you're man or woman, um, you are um, at risk because no political dissent is actually allowed. On top of that, more general political repression and increased authoritarianism, you find the super heightened uh, patriarchal mode and uh, severe forms of gender-based violence where women's rights activists are particularly vulnerable. And if you don't mind, uh, uh, I add a couple of things here as well, um, because I think the answer to that question is, uh, as my fellow panelists have really also outlined, is it depends a bit on what you do and where you do it. And so of course, the more structural, the more foundational your work is, the more feminist it is, I think the more at risk you would be. Um, what is really important to highlight as well is there, as, as is happening globally, there is a backlash against, you know, what can be referred to as, as a gender focused agenda. Um, and I'm really thinking in, in the Kurdistan region in particular right now, there are, you know, the suggestion of, of legal changes that very much challenge a women's rights um, and a gender equality agenda. And this is also um, really unfortunately targeting organizations that work uh, with and for the LGBT Q plus community. So we do have to keep that in mind that um, while there are openings and there are spaces of engagement, um, there is also somewhat a shrinking space uh, for, for that work. Uh, and in, in that regard, it is really a concerning development in the last couple of years. Thank you very much. Um, I have a follow-up question and then I'll open up uh, to others. What can we, and by we, I mean, non-Iraqi women, non-Iraqi groups and activists, but I mean foreign policy makers, foreign donors, international organizations. What can all of these organizations, groups, entities, individuals do to help Iraqi women organizations on achieving their objectives? And how can they do it without getting the usual backlash of interference, West's planning, you know, uh, not letting Iraqi women uh, shape the narrative and so on. May I? Of course. Um, I mean, the International Women's Day is the perfect time to speak about this. Uh, women of Iraq do need the support at this time, and we've heard it throughout the, um, the Zoom call coming from many levels, which felt, felt very good. Um, it always helps to tell the international community that the, uh, an extended support is needed for the Iraqi women at this time for civil society and for many levels. That's first. And second, the donor communities support the government of Iraq without the donor, uh, sorry, the donor countries support Iraq. And without the support, the government of Iraq cannot go on. They can tell Iraq what to do with their laws. They can ask them. I mean, there's a limit to how much response there will be, but uh, the, uh, the discussion, the debate needs to be opened at large as to why are your laws still allowing the killings of women and the trafficking of women in the sense of marrying them off at 14 year olds. So these are questions that need to be asked. Support should be given. And uh, I mean, you're doing a beautiful job with this Zoom call, so thank you. And one last thing to add also, uh, it's not an issue whether we need to veil or not to veil. We just, Iraqi women need to be safe. 
So when sometimes in the West, the first question that they ask us, are you with veiling of women or without veiling, against veiling of women? And we say, please uh, speak about our safety and security before anything else. The, the veil is a political matter that came into Iraq 30 years ago. But there wasn't much of it, only in the countryside before that. So let's not put it into the discussion. And um, one last thing, when, when Iraq was hit by the war, uh, the immigrants of Iraq to the, to the outer world did not get much help. I'm glad that Ukraine is getting more help now when they come to the Western Hemisphere, I mean, to North America or to Europe or other places, there is more help for them. But when we Iraqis were immigrating, it was a very tough time at the time. When, when the first day, when the war on Iraq happened. I don't want to take everybody's time. Sorry for taking too long. Thank you. Thank you very much for your answer. Um, I want to give space for more questions uh, from the audience, but I also know that uh, Professor David Cordwright has a question to ask, so go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you. Um... Sorry for the technical issues on my end. Um, you'd be no surprise that I'm, that's my weak point uh, in ability on that. But this has been a terrific program. Thank you all for such eloquent and, and informed uh, presentations. Uh, I wanted to ask reaction to an event that's going on this week in the United States Senate. Uh, I think today or very soon, the Senate Foreign Relations Committee is scheduled to vote to finally revoke the authorization to use force in Iraq that was uh, adopted uh, 20 years ago. And uh, we're unsure what the meaning of all that might be, but I, I wondered if uh, the panelists uh, might comment, uh, how will that affect uh, our relations with Iraq, uh, the US and, and Iraq, and, and will this have any meaning uh, for the issues that you've been talking about here today? Should I? Um, if I understand the question right, uh, the vote is for ending all involvement in Iraq. If well, it's the authorization to use military force in Iraq hmm. from 02 to 2002. It's always good to end the authorization for military for military force in Iraq because although we might go through a period of conflict, but it's better than having, uh, um, let's call it this way, a foreign military force in the country. But then again, there is one thing to consider that um, Iraq is under another invasion now. The Islamic Republic of Iran has its foot on half the country, the center and the south. And um, this, is, this is causing the civil war, I mean, the sectarian war between the governing blocs and the um, Sunni Shia, like uh, Noor was uh, explaining it. So uh, ending all military uh, work in Iraq uh, without securing it to be uh, in a safe, as a safe zone, it sounds scary, but the military's presence in Iraq was never beneficial for us. Let's put it that way. It is best to end it. Uh, I feel although we will be suffering uh, for a few years, but it, it has to work itself out and from the people. We had a major uprising in 2019. A million people were in the streets and the government was so scared it was trying to please the people in every way possible. And uh, an Arab Spring may come along again and it's best when there is self-determination, not an international invasion. It's, it's always better to go that way. Okay, I might, thank you very much, Yanara. I might also, want to add to what Ms. Yanar had mentioned, it is always great, it's always good to end those foreigner uh, intervention in Iraq. 
But then there is, we're looking at it from different perspective is how well is the Iraqi government currently prepared to take matters completely in hand um, with the will of its own people, of the Iraqi people. We did have this hope, this little light in 2019 with the October revolution. And in my recent visit to Iraq, which was just, you know, I just returned back in uh, January of this year, I have seen the amount of awareness that we have today on the streets with, with the new generation. They understood that this, this, these years of conflicts, those 20 years, it was very harsh. It was very hard on Iraqi people. We have lost many people. So they understood that violence is not the answer to, to everything that is going on in Iraq. So I think this is just the first step toward multiple steps that should be taken, that more, more people um, should be involved into coming on the table and having this conversation. Is it going to have an impact on women and women's security in Iraq? Definitely. Is it going to have an impact on the this, this security situation in Iraq overall? Yes, generally. But I see it as just like the first step that should has uh, that should have uh, more to come in order for us to create that peace that we're all looking for. Thank you very much. We have questions from the audience. One of the questions is about the impact of digital spaces, digital communication on the way women advocate, share information, um, can get more security. So basically, what is the impact of digital spaces on women's rights, activism, security, uh, media, and so on? Can I open my microphone? Thank yes, you. Yes. Um, in the, with the rise of, let me call it this way, with the rise of social media, let's say 10 years ago, we were so happy with it and it helped us to do much of our activism and even our uh, outreach to women in the country was all done through Facebook. And it, it helped a lot. But recently in the last few years, the uh, government control of some of these platforms and the ability of the misogynists to, to uh, work anonymously on social media and hurt us uh, has taken us so many times to police stations and even in the court cases that were put filed against us they brought our uh, our writings on social media and they used it against us in court for example our defense of life lives of lgbt people is being used against us as as if we are trying to what they say as uh, destroy the, the society with these um, with these initiatives. So social media has become scary in the past two years. But then again, we have to use it because this is the way of our outreach to, to people. If I can just follow up here, I mean, this what Yana is describing in the context, context of Iraq is, of course, a wider phenomenon that has been experienced by both women's rights activists and LGBTQI activists across the region, where sort of initially um, social media was experienced as uh, spaces for, I mean, opportunities, uh, freedom, greater connection, both internally, but also externally. Uh, but we know that um, the government across the region has been using social media to crack down on women and LGBTQI activists and um, in the most in most horrific ways. And we also know that, of course, um, Facebook and other forms of social media are increasingly controlled. And as Yanar said, across the region are used to actually um, repress people and arrest them and put them in prison. If I may as well, um, and I feel like we have to apologize a bit because I think this question was asked with a, a potentially positive um, spin or approach to social media as a space and we're kind of answering very negatively, but um, another element of this is also around um, the use of social media or online spaces as a new area of gender-based violence also. 
Um, so often you hear women's organizations that are working with um, those who have been victimized uh, talk about this as, a, as a, a new space and something to be wary of, something to be mindful of as well. Harassment, threats, and so on can be a part of this, of access to this uh, online space. Um, but the other thing is, of course, uh, it, you know, images and so on can be used to, to kind of harm women, harm young women also. Um, so it's, it's a, a double-edged sword, of course. Thank you very much. And now I have a question to all of our panelists and it's kind of like a concluding question. What is the key message or the key takeaway we should all get from this webinar? But also as many of us are non-Iraqis, what is the key message we should be taking away about the rights of women in Iraq nowadays? Don't be shy. I am never shy. That's why the Iraqi government hates me. <laughs> um, Iraqi women should uh, be supported and, and the outer world should not ask Iraqi women to be unified as they don't ask unionists to be unified or politicians to be unified. The whole spectrum of the left, the right, and the middle of the I Iraqi women's organizations should be supported because I, I wouldn't be exaggerating if I say every day more than five women get killed. They don't get reported and they don't reach to the, uh, to the index <laughs> that you've written brilliantly. Thank you very much. But uh, there is so much help that needs to be done and, um, and it's most welcome. And our government needs to be, uh, they needs to be reminded that the people did not put them in their places. A military invasion brought them forward and that they need to listen to the international community that brought them forward. Uh, they feel very free to oppress women and to demean and denigrate us in every way possible, and they should not be free to do that. The international community can be more vocal towards what the Iraqi government is doing to or allowing to, to be done to Iraqi women. Change the laws that are against the women, uh, allow more uh, international funding for us, and the Iraqi oil money, part of it should go to the women. How come Iraqi women are the, the uh, poor ones when we are living in one of the richest countries in the world? So this is what comes to mind. Yeah, and again, I like to follow up on you now. She's inspiring me a lot. Um, I think the trick is the balance is to for the international community to be vocal without imposing ideas, especially sort of liberal ideas of women's leadership or liberal ideas of women's empowerment, which I think are uh, actually damaging more than helping. And secondly, I, I in the United States, when we speak about women, women's rights, we very much recognize the idea of intersectionality. And I think intersectionality is also really crucial in the Iraqi context. I mean, there is no way that we can get, get greater gender-based equality and we, we cannot fight gender-based violence if the struggle, if that struggle is not connected or intersects with the struggle against authoritarianism, with the struggle against sectarianism, with the struggle against militarism, with the struggle against corruption. And so I think intersectionality in that context is also key. I would just worry if intersectionality is not translated into uh, ethnic divisions and sectarian divisions and the, the same po American politics that were implemented in Iraq in the beginning as to pigeonholing us into, is she a Shia woman? Is she no, a Sunni woman? The opposite. Or? It's the opposite. The idea what I mean is to actually challenge that, to challenge sectarianism, to challenge ethnic divisions. So I mean, I know that Iraqi women's rights activists, many have been at the forefront of challenging that. So that's what I mean by intersectional struggle. Well, 
Well, thank you very much for the answers. And it was a pleasure and also a lot of learning for me. And I'm just gonna speak for everybody, but for all of us to learn uh, from you, I'm going to pass uh, the word to Mora. I'm not even sure if it's a phrase to pa pass the word, but I'm gonna do it anyways to Mora. Uh, to finish this very, very inspiring, very important session. Thank you, Anna, and thank you to all of our panelists today. One of the questions in the chat um, was, um, what can U.S. policymakers do? And there have been some great suggestions uh, from this panel. If there are other suggestions from any of you um, who participated today, as follow-up to today's webinar, we'll be sending out an email and um, and following up following up with all of you in terms of ways to uh, to give input and comments uh, to the new U.S. strategy on women, peace, and security. So we want to continue this conversation from today um, and solicit additional ideas. Given that the U.S. government still has a military presence in Iraq and certainly has a um, um, very important obligation to Iraq given the, the 20 year history, um, 20 years plus, but in particular the past 20 years um, since our initial invasion. So we wanna stay connected as the, the Keough School and our different institutes, uh, we wanna stay connected with this conversation, continue this conversation and bring additional ideas and suggestions to what US policymakers should be doing um, to further the interests and the rights of Iraqi women. So thank you all for your participation today and we'll continue to keep this conversation going. And thank you very much to our wonderful panelists for all of your work and your contributions uh, and the teaching you gave, um, you, gave you offered all of us um, today on International Women's Day. Thank you everyone.